Hello and welcome to another Small Gold live stream. It is Saturday the 15th of June 2019 and because it's Saturday it is Saturday Night Silver with Small Gold and tonight's topic the Swiss named their top investments and where does gold and silver fall in that ranking. Also, we've got a lot of silver stories, only silver tonight. Tonight is Saturday Night Silver with Small Gold. Each and every Saturday night, we cover just the top silver stories. Friday night, we do cryptocurrencies. And Sunday, we do Solid Gold Sunday with Small Gold. We're going to take a look at the Perth and U.S. Mint silver sales. We're going to look at the Comex vaults and see how they're filling up or emptying. We're going to look at some market trends. We're going to look at a new find in, I think it's Ecuador. We're going to take a look at the commitment of traders. Lots of charts tonight. And we're going to look at some charts on how many COMEX contracts there are, owners per ounce, days of production required to satisfy those contracts. And we're going to take a look at some market trends, as I mentioned, solar demand. And then we're going to get to that Swiss poll on what the where silver and gold rank in the Swiss investment preferences. All right, well, let's take a look first at the price of silver mug stackers and game changers. Silver and gold had a very interesting week. Not so much the week, but the day, yesterday, Friday. Uh, both gold and silver broke out. And silver broke above $15. It had risen from about $14.90 all the way about to $15.11. And then it stopped. It was the same with gold. Gold was rising. Gold had looked like it had broke through that 1350. We've been talking about that. It had risen from 1345 all the way up to 1357, and then it broke down. And both finished the day lower. Uh, silver finished at 1484, and gold 1341. Not quite sure what drove the price rise, but like clockwork, as we've seen, especially with the gold line of 1350 or so it got repelled pretty quickly remember my thesis is that if gold breaks that continues to go higher for a few months breaks 1400 maybe even gets to 1500 that's when you'll see silver start to move otherwise as you've seen the gold silver ratio has just drifted higher and higher in my opinion because gold has flatlined and when gold flatlines and there's not significant silver industrial demand and there's even less investment demand then silver doesn't do as well that's why we've got that gold silver ratio where it is all right so let's take a look now before we get to the swiss let's take a look at some of our charts we got plenty of charts tonight remember it's all silver tonight so let's get into the silver stories of the evening i think we're going to start with let's see we got so many charts here They'll all be up on the Small Gold site tomorrow. Let's take a look at what's in the depositories, and then we'll switch over to Commitment of Traders, and then we'll look at the silver ETFs, and then we'll look at the U.S. Mint and the Perth Mint and see how they're doing. So here are the depositories. Um, remember, the COMEX-approved depositories are uh, run by companies that have agreed to hold for purposes of delivering silver and or gold to uh, satisfy contracts that are traded on the COMEX. And those silver bars have to be, it's not just any silver, it's not just any fineness, so you can't trade monster boxes, you can't use those to settle trades even though, you know, they're 500 ounces, uh, they're sealed, you would think that they would be good delivery. They're not, they have to be these thousand ounce bars. So what you're looking at is the Brinks Depository, and Brinks stacks for a lot of people, a lot of institutions, a lot of different metals and, and valuables, and they have, of the type of silver that you can use to settle uh, COMEX contracts, about 47.9 million ounces in their depository. They probably have, I don't know how much other, how many other ounces of silver they have, and I'm sure they do have other silver other than just the 1,000 ounce bars, and... You can see a lot of people are putting their silver into Brinks uh, for purposes of safekeeping. Um, the eligible stocks versus the registered stocks is a pretty important distinction. It's the same type of silver. It's the same 1,000 1, ounce bars, 9995 silver. But um, if it's registered, that means it is available immediately 
to settle contracts, which means that the person or persons or corporation that owns it can put it up and have it um, sold and receive the proceeds. Whereas if it's just eligible, it means it's just in that form and they may have no intention of ever selling it through the COMEX. They may stack it there. They may request it be sent back to them, sent somewhere else. And that's where you could see the difference. But it's the same type of silver bar. And they've got about 48 million ounces in there. And they've Now, some think it's bullish that there's a lot of silver. People are stacking it. Other people say, well, that's silver that's in there that could be used to, well, two issues. If you're thinking about manipulation, that's silver that if the paper price goes down, a company like JP Moore can use that silver to flood the market to drive the price down irrespective of... Uh, if people start buying because the paper price gets so low, well, then they can drive the price back down or at least stabilize it by using all this silver that's in the depository. It's funny, people believe, I don't believe any of this, that JP Morgan has that silver there for their own account. Let's just take a look at the JP Morgan vault, which has about 150 million ounces. Um, now, some people believe, and I don't, that this is silver they hold on their behalf. It's not. There's nothing on the J.P. Morgan balance sheet that shows this silver. This silver appears to be silver held on behalf of clients. But let's entertain the fantasy that this is silver that J.P. Morgan holds for its own account. Well, they're not doing too well with their position then, if you think about it, because they were buying in 2016 and 17 and 18, as you can see. And again, they weren't buying. This is client silver going in to the depository, but they're losing money on it. And remember, a lot of people say, well, they're going to let it ride and they're going to make all this money someday in the future. JP Morgan makes a fortune every day. They don't make this long term bet. This is the dumbest thing I ever heard that they would hold it for four, five, seven, 10, 20 years. That, that's an insignificant amount, even if the price goes tenfold. JP Morgan makes tens of billions of dollars in revenue and, and in profits. But in any event, if you want to entertain that this somehow is JP Morgan's silver play, which it's not, well, the same people who believe that also say that JP Morgan manipulates the silver price. Okay. And that someday they're going to let it ride and it's going to go higher. But what if you believe that theory that they manipulate the silver price? And the reason they manipulate the silver price is because the bankers are terrified of silver. And it's the Achilles heel and all that other nonsense. Well, this silver could be used to flood the market if the price were to go low and people were to say, hey, I'll take $12 silver, I'll take $10 silver, JP Morgan will say, okay, we can't drive the price down any lower than $10 because it will create a rush to the physical. Well, they've got plenty of physical to satisfy the demand even at $10, $9, $12. Now, I'm not saying any of this is happening. I'm just saying if you want to believe in fantasy that this silver somehow belongs to J.P. Morgan, and if you also believe that J.P. Morgan is a manipulator, why? If they can make money everywhere. There's no reason for them to focus on silver. They make a fortune ring in every other market. They don't need to focus on silver. Um, I don't even believe this is their silver, but if it is and you believe in the conspiracy, then why wouldn't they be holding this silver to dump on the market if they can't manipulate the price any lower? Just a thought. We'll see what you guys think. I don't even think it's worth entertaining, but if you're going to listen to this kind of palaver, you might as well examine all potential sides. Now, here's coins and things. This is in Massachusetts. They've got about 26 million ounces. But this, again, the, the, these facilities are adding uh, lots of silver, it looks like, although Delaware Depository looks like it's losing silver. It's down to about 15 million ounces. A couple of years ago, it was up around 26. It's not one of the bigger depositories. HSBC, which is the largest gold depository, also has some silver, about 29 million ounces. Not bad, but they once had about 45 million. That's not their primary focus. If we roll it all up uh, into the, um, let's just see how it all looks this way. There you go. You can see JP Morgan, the red line is the biggest depository of 150 million, about half of all of the silver. And you can see Scotia Makata, HSBC, Delaware. Depository, JP Morgan Chase, and coins and things. I think I have a chart that shows it all roll here. It is all rolled up together. And there it is. It's about 300 million ounces. Now, there's another story out there. There's no silver left 
to satisfy the contracts. It's going to be game over and game changer and Comex collapse. Same people who will tell you that JP Morgan has all this silver. Well, you can't believe one and not the other. So if JP, if you believe JP Morgan has all this silver, whether it's theirs and in their name, or whether it's just there and it's not in their name, it's still there to satisfy Comex contracts. Well, that means there is no danger of a Comex default because they have 150 million ounces. And then people say, you can't believe what they say. Okay, well then JP Morgan doesn't have any silver. You're going to have to pick. If you think JP Morgan either has the silver or doesn't have the silver. And if they have the silver, is it theirs or does it belong to clients? Most people are thinking, they're insisting that JP Morgan has the silver and it belongs to them. I don't believe that. Well, if they have the silver and it belongs to them and it's in a COMEX vault and it's listed there and it's eligible and registered for trading, then it's there to satisfy contracts and you're not going to have a COMEX default. And given that there's 302 million ounces in the vault, it's really not that big of an issue. So you get all these people trying to tell you there's a silver shortage, your COMEX is going to default. They've been telling you that for 10, 15 years. These stories are rubbish. They really are, and people believe them. And, and there's a reason why silver hasn't risen for 10 years. These stories are not the way to sell silver. This is how many people or many bullion dealers sell silver through these silly stories. And I believe it actually keeps people away in the long term because they're always saying something's around the corner, set the skyrocket, set the skyrocket, based on these theories that really there's nothing to them. And then doesn't happen and people see that and you lose credibility all right let's look at the commitment of traders and uh, well this this other concept owners per ounce a lot of people have it it's stuck in their head they're trading so much paper contracts and there's there's no silver to back them up we just saw this 302 million ounces worth of silver in the comex vaults now you can say i don't believe that okay don't believe that then jp morgan doesn't have any silver either because that's part of what they're saying is in the comex vaults but look at this one. This is the one that shows, this is very clear, thanks to Nick Laird, shows what the number of contracts are in each contract. is 1,000, and it shows how many contract ounces. There are 5,000 ounces per contract. There's a mini contract that I think is 1,000 ounces, but most of the contracts are the large one. And the mini contract doesn't have a delivery option, but the, the large one does, the 5,000 standard contract. Well, there's about a billion ounces, 1.1. You can't really see it. It's in the second box down. The top box is the price of silver, and it's pretty, you can see it's flatlined since it hit its peak in 2011. But the second box shows about one, it says 1167.78 million ounces. It's 1.167 billion ounces of contracts trading. You say, well, that's ridiculous. It's 1 billion ounces of silver. They can't possibly cover that. Yeah, they can. Look at the next thing down. They got 302 million ounces. Now, if you know anything about COMEX trading, the bulk of the traders are there. Some of them are bullion dealers, so they're, they're just a hedge to sell silver short to cover their inventory that they have. Others are there just to trade price. They don't want the silver. You got to remember, if somebody wants silver, they'll go out and buy it. They'll broker it, and they'll get the silver, and they'll stack it, and they'll stick it in the vaults, either a Comex approved vault or somewhere else. Most of the traders there, most of these contracts, by their terms, they either expire or they roll them over. Some of them do take delivery, but there's plenty of silver there. And what this shows here, owners per ounce, it's really not owners. But is the amount of silver, 302 million ounces, and then you divide the 1.16 billion ounces by the 302 billion ounces, and you see that there's only three claims per contract in the whole scheme of things. And we know that 95, 99% of the contracts are not interested or for whatever reason, they don't take delivery. It's not even a close to an issue. Your bank is more fraction, far more fractionally reserved than this. If people wanted to, there's only like $2 trillion worth of cash in the world. And there's tens of trillions of dollars worth of uh, cash deposits. Uh, and of that $2 trillion, according to the Fed, one point, more than 60% of it's overseas. So there's not that much cash even in the United States. Not that it's back with them. The point is that this is another story that you hear. They're trading all these paper contracts and the silver's not there. No, it is there. There's not an issue. If somebody wants to stand for delivery, they can. If half the contracts, which would be outrageous, want to stand for delivery, why would they want to stand for delivery? They're not stackers. These are traders. They're getting paid on fiat. They live their life in fiat. They get their bonus in fiat. They're trading the price. But even if half of them decided, oh, no, we're stacking for the apocalypse, well, there's 302 million ounces there. All right. Now, the other thing is, 
that people get all excited about. And again, it's mischaracterizes. Well, they're trading. Look at this chart. It's outrageous. They're trading 170 days worth of mining production. And that's the shorts. And this is outrageous. And the silver's not there. Well, it kind of is. Because what is 170 days of silver mining production? Well, they mine about 800 million ounces of silver a year. A little more than that. 170 is give or take less than half of that. So it's about 360, 380 million ounces of silver that are being sold short. Well, we see there's 300 million plus ounces in the depository. And again, most of these contracts, they don't, they, they don't run to the point where then they're standing for delivery. This is a paper market, but it's not this big of a farce as people want to make it out to be. Crimex and you hear all this stuff and it's, and the reason they tell you this is they tell you this because they want you to believe that there's something going on that once it stops, which there's no reason for this market to stop, this is how it is, that that's when silver's going to skyrocket and the physical will take over the paper pro No, this is how it's done. This is how it's traded. And it's not at a point where there's they're trading around 10 ounces of silver, meaning they're trading around 10 ounces, meaning there's only 10 ounces of silver in the COMEX vault. There's 300 million plus ounces. That's a lot of silver. And again, they're there trading. I, I saw a very interesting uh, interview. I think it was on Kitgo or LBMA. It's the same thing. They were talking about gold. And the person was saying, yeah, I met some of the gold traders. And there were gold traders there had been trading for 20, 30 years. They had never even held gold in their hand. So this woman brought one of the bars that they trade. It just shows you the disconnect between this type of financialization and Wall Street and the way they operate with fiat stuff. They're not even, they don't think stacking. They're not, they don't look at it the same way. They're looking at a price. And you can see it's the same with, well, now the reason also the platinum, gold and silver, there's no, the demand for those are not the same as oil, as corn, cocoa, because you actually need those on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas you don't need to have your gold today. You don't need to have it next week. You don't need silver you do for industry, but the metals are less important on a daily basis than foodstuffs, obviously. All right. Let's see what else we have for trading. I like to look at the commitment of traders. We've talked about this before, but you can see there was a time when the, the commercials were net long for the first time in 40 years, which was true, uh, but that was a result of the silver price falling for such a long period of time that eventually the shorts went long and the longs went short. And we're seeing that again, or we were seeing that. We had a very similar situation where we were losing a price where the price was going down in um, last year for about six months. And then this year, the price has gone down for about four months. And we saw the same dynamic. But now that the price is rising, the commercials are back to being that short. All right. I think that's it on the trading stuff for our silver. Yes, we've done the depositories. We've done days of mining. Let's take a look now at our U.S. Mint and Perth Mint. Now, a very interesting dynamic. I've got more charts, but tonight we're just going to focus on relation between the first six months of the year from 2016, 17, 18, and 19, and take a look. Now, the U.S. Mint, and I don't have all the charts tonight, but we've shown them on other nights. The U.S. Mint had a record of 47 million Americans over eagles sold in 2015. Year before that, it was like 44 million. Year before that, two, 42 million. There was a period of time where the U.S. Mint, after 2009, ratcheted up to 27 million, to 40 million, 34 million, 42 million, 44 million, 45 million. And then in 2016, it looked like they were going to sell 50 million. It was amazing because you can see here uh, the blue being uh, 2016, January, February, March, April, May, June. You had these months where you had almost 6 million the first month, 4.7, 4.1, 4, 4.4. 4. In June of 2016 is when the retail American silver demand just fell off the table. And you can see 2017. Now, January is always a big month, but it's not really indicative of anything because 
There's a little gaming of the system going on there. Silver is sold through authorized purchasers. The U.S. Mint doesn't sell them to SD Bullion. They don't sell them to a bunch of the um, bullion dealers directly other than Atmex. They sell them through authorized purchasers, and Atmex happens to be an authorized purchaser. And then they on sell them. And one of the ways that you get in and make sure that you always have an allocation from the Mint, the ones that buy the most or the, their allocation at the beginning of the year uh, will always get their allocation. If you say, nah, nah I'm good. Nah, I don't I don't think we're going to have much demand this year. So I'm not going to, the next time they come around, or there's a, you won't get your allocation as an authorized purchaser. So in the beginning of the year, companies will, they know that every year, even if they buy five, as in, in the aggregate, four or five million, that uh, even if it's a bad year, they'll still sell eight to 10, 12 million that year. So they're willing to pump up their January purchases just to make sure in case there's a big run on silver like there was in 2012, 13, 14, 15, and early 16, that they're always going to be in good graces with the mint. So you really have to discount the January numbers because they're going to buy a lot. Even if they get stuck with it for a few months, it's okay because they know by the end of the year they'll definitely get rid of them. It's really your follow-through in February which starts to tell you how the year is going to go. And there's where you can see 2017, they held back and they said, hmm, I don't think so. And then you could see that I put in the numbers the top selling months and they were all in 2016. And then your bottom selling months were last year, 2018, only 380,000 sold in May and only 435,000 sold in June. Now we're doing a little better this year if you look at the chart. Uh, we had some solid follow through in February. You could see February was better than February this year was better than 2017, 2018. But then there was a little hanky panky going on. They didn't have enough silver planchets. They withheld sales. And then I think what happened was the silver demand for Eagles was satisfied through existing stocks. What do I mean by existing stocks? I'm talking about prior dated years silver Eagles. And they come to market a lot, and your bullion dealers will buy them from you, and then they'll on-sell them. They'll pay you depending. Remember, the authorized purchasers pay for a new Silver Eagle, $2 over the spot price of silver, no matter what the price is. Then, of course, they'll sell them to a bullion dealer, maybe for $0.10 cents more, $0.20 cents more. And then the bullion dealer will mark them up again and sell them to you. And so a new Silver Eagle, a really good price, is going to be two twenty nine over spot. So there's like a 29 cent premium over what the authorized purchasers paid. But in when there's a shortage or the mint has to stop making current year dated Silver Eagles, you can buy prior year dated Silver Eagles because people will sell them to bullion dealers. And bullion dealers will generally pay you, oh, either anywhere from at least spot for the Silver Eagles and probably up to a dollar maybe. For a spot it depends on the dealer and that and therefore if they pay a dollar over spot or anything under that they can sell them to you for let's say only two dollars over spot and they'll make a buck a coin so i think what happened in 2000 and it's just speculation in 2019 was the mint stopped selling because they didn't have enough planchets and then demand got met by prior year data and people started thinking oh it's a better deal anyway i can get a 2016 to 2015, 2018 American Silver Eagles for you know $2 over spot instead of paying waiting for the 2019s to come back online for maybe 240. I might as well get the old ones. And then you could see the sales just stopped. The, the green line goes down. You gotta remember there's now about over 600 million of these things out there. And um, since they weren't used for currency, people aren't passing them around. Most of them are in rolls or in good shape, and they can be sold back to the bullion dealers and then on sold to other customers in the secondary market. So again, there's an overhang there for American Silver Eagles. But you can see, now when we, we move over to the Perth Mint, you don't see the same drop. I mean, if you look at the two charts, you got from 5.9 million in January all the way down to 380,000 in May, forget the, the January, look at May 2016, you got 4.498 4 
million American Silver Eagles sold. And then in the same month, just three years later, you have only 380,000. I mean, that is a tremendous drop. That is a drop of, let's see, four, four, eight, eight. That's like an 85% drop. That's a massive drop. And that indicates a decline in silver demand. Now, there are people out there, they're lying, the mint is lying. There's no reason for the mint to lie about this. And even to consider that, that's just some type of hopium that somehow there's this massive demand for silver that the mint is suppressing. I don't think so. Talk to bullion dealers, they'll tell you what the current sales are for 2019 dated coins. Yeah, they're selling them, but they're not selling them the way they once were three, four, and five years ago. And then don't believe that JP Morgan was the big buyer back then. No, retail sales were strong back then. It had nothing to do with JP Morgan buying silver. All right. Now let's look at pers well, let's look at the premiums. It's important to look at, but it's not that important right now. The Silver Eagle premiums, the only buying tip I can give is at the end of the each year, you could see it in December. The then year if if a if a silver bullion dealer manages their inventory right, they won't have stockpiles of current year dated silver eagles. They will sell, they'll buy the 2016s and buy maybe up low, up uh, their inventory a couple of times during the year. And by the end of the year, they probably want to be out of 2016s because when 2017 comes, they want to put their order in and get 2017s. And generally what happens is bullion dealers boost the price up just a bit at the end of the year because they're sold out or they're going to be sold out. And they know that if people are collecting and they haven't purchased their then year dated uh, Silver Eagles that they're probably willing to pay just to make sure they get one or get 10 or whatever they do collecting, they're buying whatever the number they're buying. You could see at the end of the year the premium seems to go up at the end of each year. Um, and then it drifts back down. The premiums are generally not important, um, but that's a tip there. I mean, if unless you need to have that year's current dated coin and you're willing to pay for it, you probably either better off waiting for the new coin, the lower price, or buying prior dated coins with lower premiums on them. Because remember, what'll happen is, even though there's a premium, you can see on the 2016, 2017, 2018, at the end of the year, those coins eventually won't be worth that premium that because they'll be in the pile of prior dated coins so in 2019 i'm sure you could have bought a 2016 or 17 coin at a lower premium than you could have bought during that particular year at the end of the year so it generally doesn't make sense to buy current year dated coins at the end of the year at the higher premium go for the prior dated coins at that point or just wait for the new coin uh, the new year and then later on in the year you could probably get the year's prior coin at a lower price all right it's a lot of work but uh it's just a, something i've noticed now let's look at the perth mint the perth mint très interessant here. they have the same general trend in silver uh, demand but it has not you don't have the same dramatic fall you don't have an 85 percent drop anywhere on this chart uh, you may have a 50% uh, drop, but not an 80% drop. Um, also, because of the drop in American Silver Eagle demand, there are some months, they're here, where you can see them, where the Perth Mint actually has been outselling the U.S. Mint. And that was unheard of. Even in the biggest and baddest year, when I say baddest, I mean good, the biggest and best year that or month that the Perth Mint ever had was only 3.5 million ounces and that was the month that they came out with the Australian silver kangaroo in September 2015 uh, 2000 yeah 2015 uh, since then though they've they've stabilized in many months they will sell a million ounces of silver although not so much I don't think they did it once this year but they're not bad I mean you can see the green line is this year there's a couple of nine I didn't put all the numbers in but there's a couple of 900,000, 800,000 months. And then the same 2018, there was a million month in January, almost a million in February. So they have some decent months. And some of those months are better than the U.S. Mint, which shows that while overall silver demand has fallen across the board 
for investment silver, it's just the amount in the U.S. is, is really staggering the, the, the fall off. And it's not as much in, uh, in the Australian Perth Mint. All right, let's see what else do we have for silver tonight. We've got, we still got to talk about those Swiss and what they're liking and what they're not liking for investment. Um, let's take a look at the silver ETFs. This is an interesting dynamic, and again, it, it kind of ties into the COMEX vault. There's a lot of silver being poured into ETFs. You see the Sprott one is the pink. Uh, the ETF at the bottom is uh, SLV. Um, this is unlike the dynamic with the gold ETFs. The gold ETFs, if the price goes up, then gold flows into the ETF. Price goes down, gold flows out of the ETF. But if you look here, since 2006, six seven when they started these things, they just seem to they add more and more silver. Now, it is down a bit from 2016. But basically, from 2006 to 2016, no matter what happened with the price, you can see the price is the black line going through there. But they basically continue just to add silver. And we're on an upswing now in the last three months. You can see the far end of the chart. Almost 600 million ounces of silver in um ETF, you add in the 300 million ounces at the COMEX vault, you're at 900 million. There's another chart I have that picks up what's in gold money, bullion vault, Perth Mint, other places that store silver. And you got like 1.2 billion in silver stored. That's strength, you know, that's new because, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you didn't have the same identifiable silver stockpiles. And there wasn't that much silver in the COMEX vault. I don't have the chart to show you, maybe I'll show you next week. On Saturday night but um, this 300 million ounces in comics is a lot and of course ETFs are a relatively new creation all right let's see what else do we got for our silver before we get into the Swiss a couple of news stories on demand now there was a big mining find in Ecuador a huge deposit gold copper silver uh, any of you guys remember when I did the silver for silk and silk for silver when the Europeans discovered the new world and all the silver and the gold in Central and uh, South America, they used that silver to go and buy goods in China where they really needed. There was a silver shortage, so it all worked out fine. Europeans found silver in the Americas and they went nuts for that China stuff. When I say China, I mean like uh, porcelain and silk and that's what China excelled at and they figured out a way to go from the Pacific on the other side of you know Mexico there and, and go all the way into the Philippines and trade that way anyway they're still finding it there look this is Ecuador they're finding a big uh, project there and uh, just keep an eye on how that project goes now there's a story in there's a Wall Street Journal Silver prices have fallen to the lowest level relative to gold in more than 26 years amid concerns over global growth. I'm not sure that that's the rationale. You know, many of you listen to this channel. My reasoning for silver falling for the last 10 years versus gold is that gold has retained and, and probably even enhanced its monetary component because of central bank buying, uh, because of the underlying even though they say the financial crisis was solved in 2009, 2010, most people have it at least in the back of their heads that it really wasn't, that the U.S. did QE after that, uh, China issued three times more debt than everybody else, the European Union, ECB did QE, Bank of Japan has been printing, Bank of England, they're all gone to zero interest rates, negative interest rates. So I think gold has not really lost any of its investment demand or investment luster and there's still a lot of demand for gold jewelry in China and India because there's a wealth effect so you've kind of had the best of both worlds even though gold shot up to uh, 1911 is now down at 1350 you got to remember where it was before then before then it was 200 400 600 800 so it's still well above its 2008 now silver it's not the same thing and I believe that is because Gold's investment, gold's demand profile is basically jewelry and investment, and that investment is in the form of bullion for individuals, for corporations, or 
entities and also central banks. And then also a lot of the gold jewelry is considered investment, 22, 24 karat gold, especially in India and China. Silver, as we know, is more of an industrial metal. And over the last few years, its investment component has dropped below 15%. It's like 10, 12%. You saw the big decline in silver. So during this time period of relative economic calm, but still in the back of people's heads, economic uncertainty, gold has maintained its investment demand profile where silver has basically lost it. And the big demand for silver is solar electronics, of which they're not going gangbusters. And electronics demand is actually down over the last 10 years. Solar demand is up, but it's not up significantly, which is somewhat surprising because there has been a, a tremendous amount of solar panels being produced far more than they were 10 years ago, but they've learned to thrift. They've learned to use less silver per panel. So the, the silver demand for solar is not growing exponentially. And as I mentioned, the silver demand for electronics is actually on the decline. And the reason for that is you've got more devices, but they're smaller devices. And again, they learn how to use uh, less silver per device. Now, this is saying it's because of concerns over global growth. Yes, that does help or hurt, meaning that if there's less industrial demand for silver, that's not going to help. And then, of course, if there's less investment demand, well, then demand is not skyrocketing and therefore the price versus gold is not moving higher. Now, here's some bad news on the solar side. Solar demand in India. India has the largest uh, solar power plant in the world. They completed that a couple of years ago. Uh, they've got a lot of plans for solar. They've got a lot of uh, facilities across the country. However, India cut solar capacity addition target by 23% for the next couple of years. In face of lingering issues of land acquisition, uncertainty over taxes, import duties, slowdown in overall economic growth, India has reduced its solar capacity projections. So, not good for silver on the demand side. Now, what's going to help silver, in my mind, is if there is a monetary boost for gold. And if that boost comes and gold goes higher... Silver still retains a, a monetary component. It's a small component, but because it's a small market, a boost in that component can really drive the price higher. Now, people always talk about, but silver is so useful. And silver is in yoga pants. Yeah, that's true. Silver has a lot of useful properties. So does copper. Copper is very useful. Um, but here's a story here. Silver makes beautiful bling, but it's also good for keeping the bacterial bugs away. Now, a lot of people say, well, what about that? Isn't that a source of demand? They're finding new uses for it every day. Yeah, but the amount of silver that is used in, for example, medical devices, uh, clothing, you're talking about nanoparticles in many instances. So it's not a, while there may be finding many, many uses for silver, it's not requiring tonnage in the same way that and even, you know, we're seeing in the electronics and in the solar, those are the two biggest industrials, they're finding ways of using less and less of it. I actually believe that the, the commodity portion of silver is not going to rise dramatically, even if, even if solar goes higher. You're going to have to get a either, which you have in India, you do have a wealth effect where middle class Indians are buying a lot of silver jewelry and they also buy the most silverware. Most people don't buy silverware, but Indians buy it. And if you get a return to a monetary component, a lot of people say silver is money, it's always been money. No, it's not. Right now, no one thinks of it that way. You may think of it that way. You may point to all your silver denariuses and Romans being paid in silver and the Constitution. So it doesn't matter. The global view on silver is it is not a monetary metal. It's not used as a medium of exchange. However, if gold does rise, you will see, I believe, and we've seen it in the past, the price of silver rise alongside gold because silver is in times of crisis considered a cheaper gold. However, it's not always considered that. If you look at a price chart of silver, the times that it has gone on its rocket rides, 1979, 1980, and 2010, 2011, it spiked and then it immediately dove. Because I believe what happens is when silver spikes, a lot of people who've bought it for its monetary purposes, that's when they swap it out for gold. 
if they're concerned. So just keep that in mind. It's not a prediction. It's not investment advice. But that is what's happened the past couple of years. Now, I think we got uh, one more story before I let you go. Well, we'll get to some comments. But, um, yeah, let me get to you the results of our Swiss poll. Now, the thing about the Swiss, you guys got to you know this probably, is Switzerland, and I've done, you can Google it, uh, gold per capita, small gold. And Switzerland, even though it sold 60% of its gold in 2000, has the most gold, or when I say Switzerland sold, and I mean the Central Bank of Switzerland, the Swiss National Bank, sold a lot of their silver, small country, I think it's 8, 9, 12 million people there, per capita, they've got the most gold per person. Um, so, you would have to wonder, in this poll, where did gold fall as a preferred investment for the Swiss? Where did silver fall? Well, a little surprising, but not, not that surprising. According to the University of St. Gallen, this is a poll that they took. Gold is among the most popular, but was not the most popular. The most popular investment in Switzerland is real estate. Okay, hard asset. 53% of those interviewed said that's what we got to have. However, gold came in second, 48%. Think of that. Half the people in Switzerland think that gold is the best investment. I guarantee you ask that question in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Australia, Japan, you're going to get single digits. Switzerland, 48%. Second most, imagine if the world was like Switzerland, there's not that many people there, but they, they have a close affinity to gold, 48%. Shares, stock shares, only 30%. So gold being far ahead of shares, I would say in the United States, you're probably going to get shares in real estate at the top. Gold might get mentioned. Funds, so stock funds, bond funds, 25%. And then savings accounts, 24%. Putting your money in the bank. I guess they think their banks are secure. So a quarter of the people think that a bank account's a good investment, but double that. 48% think gold is a good investment. That makes sense. You're better off having your money in gold in a bank than you are for, than you are to have um, the Swiss francs. Interestingly enough, before we get to silver, you can buy gold at a bank. I was looking at this article here. Um, with an average of 62% of mentions, people's principal banks are the preferred provider for purchases of precious metals in all language regions. Now remember in Switzerland you've got, ooh, I think you have four languages. Yes, you've got in the north, the south, you've got Italian Swiss, you have French Swiss, you have German Swiss, which is about 60% of the country, and then there's another small part called Romanish. I think it's kind of a blend of some type of Latin-based language with a little German probably mixed in. That's a small percentage, but most of them buy, the preferred way to buy gold is at their uh, bank. Um, second place where they buy it is metal traders, uh, or just a, you know, that has a, like a coin shop, a local coin shop. So more, 62% buy at a bank, only less than 20% buy it at a, what they call uh, in this article, precious metals traders with stationary business. That'd be a local coin shop. And then, uh, online about 8%. So gold, very strong. Now, where does silver come out in this? Well, there's a couple other that come ahead of silver. Actually, there's a lot that come ahead of silver, which to me is not surprising. As I mentioned, in the United States, more investment silver is sold, not per capita, but in the aggregate, than there is investment silver sold in China. Now, obviously, China buys a lot more gold than the United States. This concept of silver as an investing investment metal is pretty much limited to the United States. If you look at the European numbers, uh, the best-selling European silver coin is the Australian Philharmonic, I'm mean, the Austrian Philharmonic, not the Australian Philharmonic, the Austrian Philharmonic, which is next to Switzerland, Austria. And they only sell three, four million a year. Now, part of that's because they have VAT on silver, but still, it's not a big seller. But let's go through the other things. Um, this one was interesting. So we said number one was real estate, two was gold, 
The shares were third, funds were fourth, savings accounts were fifth. They don't list the others. But then ninth place, Platinum. Now that's, I guess, not surprising because Platinum historically has been worth more than gold. And if you like gold and Platinum is considered like better gold, I don't think that, but that's the idea. Generally, when you have a levels like of a credit card, you have a silver card, a gold card, a platinum card. A lot of companies do that. They have the platinum level is the top. Well, recently, the last couple of years, platinum is worth less than gold. It's even worth less than um, palladium and less than rhodium, but that's beside the point. But platinum, ninth. I mean, if you ask people in the United States, I guarantee you it won't show up in the top 10, platinum. Well, I mean, platinum is an afterthought. I don't even think people even know what platinum is. A clearly 48% of the people say gold in Switzerland, but platinum comes in ninth, per, ninth place. But silver, sorry, 13th place. So the Swiss are not big on silver. You may find someone in Switzerland and say, oh, but my friend in Switzerland, he says, well, I'm just telling you what the, the poll said. Uh, I have seen plenty of evidence that the Swiss, I mean, they had their Save Our Swiss Gold campaign. They mass thousands of signatures to try to force the Swiss National Bank to get their gold back that they sold to back the, I mean you would never have that in the United States I mean 48% of the people think that holding gold is the best investment Switzerland is a unique country indeed all right well let's see what you guys are saying by the way go and um, sign up at uh, I, this this I'm very lucky tonight we didn't get cut off at all uh, many nights on YouTube, I just get cut off and I have to stop. And last night I had a lot more crypto stories to cover, but I didn't get to them because of the um, we got cut off. So what I'm trying to do is, and if I do get cut off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue the program. I'm going to record it and I'll post it on BitChute. So BitChute's the backup. We're getting almost as many views there as we are on YouTube. I'm on Minds. I'm on Twitter. I'm on I, I, Facebook. You can forget. I'm not even going to bother with that. I'm on Parler. I'm on Gab, I'm on Steemit, and of course on smallgold.com. So check all of those out, subscribe, even on DLive, but I haven't done anything there yet. But uh, I try to post all, everything gets up on BitChute, everything on my. Unbelievable. I take my, my my eye off the thing. I'm talking. I don't know what I'm... And I got cut off. And you know what I was talking about? I was talking about all the other channels where you can go find Small Gold and boom, the stream goes. Anyway, BitChute, Parlar, P-A-R-L-E-R, D-Live, Steam It, Gab, and um, there's one more. Well, Twitter, of course. Anyway, and SmallGold.com. All right, let's see. And of course, you can support the channel by donating via Bitcoin or Litecoin. There's uh, your Q codes right there on the screen. You hold your phone up. You can make a small donation. You can buy a small gold mug um, on the website or at the small gold store or any other of the small gold. Uh, plenty of mugs, beer mugs and if you are all our mug stackers, you can get them there, and that helps the site out. And then you can send a check, money order, or you can send gold or silver to Small Gold LLC, P.O. Box 714, Dover, New Hampshire, 03820. You can become a Small Gold patron, or you can send a one-time donation via PayPal, or you can make a recurring donation via PayPal, or you can sign up for one of the mug clubs on Subscribe Star. I do appreciate all the support. And let's see what you guys are saying. See what we're saying tonight. Remember tonight, join us tomorrow. We're gonna do solid gold Sunday. We're gonna do some of the same stuff. Look at the commitment of traders. Look at the Comex warehouses and gold. A couple of the gold stories. And then back to we've got to get back to the build bar and the Muller and all that stuff that's going on. Um, just haven't had time. And getting cut off doesn't help because 
or you get behind on material. All right, bit you now. Phyllis here, Roger. Roger, small, do you have an exit plan for your own personal silver stack? Uh, I don't really have a silver stack that I need to exit from anymore. Okay, let's see. I'm going to melt them into mugs. I mean, whatever, whatever I have stored away, I'm just going to leave there. I mean, it's, I don't really, it's not significant. So, it's not, um, most of my assets are in my house. Meaning, not in my house, I mean in purchase of the house and that is uh, what my investment is mostly which is why I'm able to talk fairly objectively about all this stuff I'm, I don't consider myself a, a stacker all right now uh, yeah I'll melt it into silver mugs and so on are right, any other questions here um, small I talked about the meeting that was held this past January which included super rich people Binance Gemini Coinbase they must have made deals and cut up the territory. Yeah, I forgot. I called that um, cryptocurrencies. Um, what's the word? Cryptocurrencies. Jekyll Island. Yes. Where they all met. All right. What else do we got? Uh, I got nothing if you got a lot of comments here. All right. Looks like I got no more comments. So I want to thank everyone for joining me tonight. And tomorrow we'll be back for Solid Gold Sunday with Smoggle. We'll discuss uh, gold. And then again, Monday, back to the news. And then Friday night, crypto. Saturday night, silver. Sunday night, gold. All right. Thanks, everyone. And if uh, there's no further questions or comment, I'm going to turn it over to Bernie, who's going to give you the 10 second countdown. Bernie, you ready? Yo, so the thing about Trump is he's got to be impeached. And we've got to make. Bernie. The countdown. Okay. Oh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1%. Have a good night. Good night, Bernie, and good night, everyone.